So welcome to your first real lecture on physics um, for our online course. And we're going to be starting with chapter 7, which is the hydrogen atom in wave mechanics. So to remind you of some things that we learned about in Modern 1, um, we're going to first cover the Bohr model of the atom, review it, and then talk about why there were holes in the Bohr theory um, and develop the quantum mechanical solution to the Bohr model of the atom in very light detail um, since you guys aren't required to have differential equations and things like that in order to take this course. So it'll be a very happy smiley coverage of the hydrogen atom. Um, it's an important system, the hydrogen atom, because it's actually the only atomic system that you can exactly solve. All other um, atoms have multiple electrons, and then it becomes more than just having to consider the nucleus and the electron, and you actually have to consider the potential energies of all the other electrons. Um, and that gets messy because the electrons are moving around very fast with respect to each other, and so it would be very complicated to um, get an exact solution to that system. What you can do instead, however, is various modeling techniques, um, but those have to be done on a computer and can't be solved exactly. Now, you can apply it to other atoms as long as they're ionized. In other words, as long as they only have one electron, you can still use it. So you can apply it to, for example, helium, uh, helium ions or doubly ionized lithium, and uh, the system works pretty well for that. Um, the hydrogen atom, though, is an ideal system for precision tests of theory against experiment. Um, the quantum numbers that you use when you solve the hydrogen atom are the same quantum numbers that are used for every other atom in the periodic table. Um, and this allows us, this development allows us to understand the atoms and their place in the periodic table and why they behave as they do. Um, we have to really understand atomic structure before we attempt to deal with bonding in atoms or electronic structures of solids. If you don't understand one atom, in other words, then you can't understand a solid material. Um, and the full mathematical solution of the Schrodinger equation applied to the hydrogen atom is really pretty beautiful and complete and describes very well the atom's properties. But before we get into that, um, I'd like to review some of the stuff that we talked about in Modern 1 regarding the Bohr model of the atom. Now, you might recall that the spectrum of an excited gas, and you can do this a lot of ways, you can apply a voltage and excite the gas that way, or you can burn the gas, there's flame spectroscopy. Um, anyway, what happens is the gas gets excited and emits light. Now, unlike white light um, that comes from a source like a light bulb or something like that, what's generated when you excite a gas is um, light with very specific wavelengths or colors. And it can act as a fingerprint for identifying that gas. So what it's called is these are pictures of emission line spectra for various elements. Um, hydrogen, helium, lithium are given here. You can see that hydrogen is actually the simplest of all the uh, spectra. And then as you um, go up in atomic number, the spectra get more and more complex. Um, when you look at it this way, when you excite the gas and look at the line that comes out, you're looking at emission spectroscopy. Of course, in Modern 1, we also discussed absorption spectroscopy, which is when you pass white light through a gas and look at the light that's absorbed by the gas. So you can do that too. But emission spectroscopy is maybe prettier, so we'll, we'll look at that. Um, the man that first tried to describe mathematically what was going on with these emission spectroscopy was Johannes Balmer. And in 1885, he actually came up with an equation that correctly predicted the visible spectrum of hydrogen. Now, there's other wavelengths that hydrogen emits. It can emit in the UV and in the infrared. Um, but, of course, the visible light is the easiest one to see, and so that one was the first one to describe. And so here is a picture of what the visible light spectrum of hydrogen looks like. We call the red line the H alpha, the H beta is the green line, um, the H gamma is the blue, and the H delta is the violet. Um, and there's a really interesting picture of Balmer right there for you. Now the equation that he came up with to describe this was equal to 1 over lambda, uh, where lambda is your wavelength. Um, is equal to the Rydberg constant, 
and the Rydberg constant was a fit that he extracted from the spectra, 1.097 times 10 to the seventh inverse meters. And then you multiply your Rydberg constant times one over two squared minus one over n squared, where n is an integer that starts at three and goes up from there. And if you do that, you can correctly predict what the late wavelengths of light coming off the hydrogen spectrum are. Now, as I mentioned, there's other wavelengths and other um, spectra that you can look at. You can look at the infrared and the UV spectrum. The ultraviolet spectrum is the Lyman series and it looks very much the same as the Balmer series except in, instead of 1 over 2 squared in the, in the front of those parentheses you've got just 1 over 1 squared or 1. And then the passion in the bracket are the infrared portions of the hydrogen spectrum and yet again the equation is pretty much the same except the first term is 1 over 3 squared and 1 over 4 squared respectively rather than 1 over 2 squared. So those are the series that describe it. Now what Bohr tried to do, Niels Bohr, was he tried to explain using theory what we saw in the spectrum of hydrogen. Okay. Now the way that he did that was he came up with sort of a semi-planetary model, okay, a semi, semi-quantum quantum description, if you will, okay. What he said was, well, the proton at the center of the hydrogen nucleus and the electron are opposite charges, and so they're attracted to one another via the Coulomb potential that we're familiar with, I hope. Um, and that is what's providing the force, the centripetal force, for an electron to move in a circular orbit around the nucleus. Okay, so Coulomb force provides a centripetal force. And the electron is traveling with some speed v um, around the nucleus, and you can set the centripetal force mv squared over r equal to the Coulomb force, um, which is the Coulomb constant k times e squared over r squared. Okay, now only certain electron orbits are stable, and he didn't really have a very clear explanation for why certain electrons um, certain electron orbits were stable. But he did notice that um, that corresponded to certain values of the angular momentum for the electron. Okay, um, But he said, okay, well some orbits are stable. Uh, we're going to ignore the whole accelerating charges radiate thing and assume that the electron just keeps its energy as it moves in the circular orbit even though it is constantly accelerating because it's moving in a circle. All right. However, even though it doesn't radiate due to going around in a circle, it will radiate if it changes um, from one orbit to another orbit, okay? Because the different orbits will have different energies, and in order to conserve energy, the electron will absorb or emit a photon when it changes the energy of that orbit. The frequency of the photon would be given by the difference in the energy levels, delta E, and that sets equal to Planck's constant H times the frequency of the light that's emitted. Okay? And he was very careful to say you can't treat these classically. Okay, this is not a classical kind of thing. Now, as he said, he didn't have a full explanation for why these things weren't radiating, but he did know that there were certain orbits of the electron that were special. And he decided that probably it had something to do with a condition imposed on the electron's orbital angular momentum. And he got this wrong. I just want to go ahead and emphasize this. This is an incorrect statement. But at the time, his hypothesis was if it's an integer multiple of h bar, Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, then that would be the angular momentum that is allowed. So 1 h bar, 2 h bar, 3 h bar. As long as you keep those values, then um, you'll have an allowed electron orbit. Okay, now using techniques um, from classical mechanics, he said he derived what the energies of these energy levels were for the electrons in these orbits. And he said, okay, the total energy is going to be equal to the sum of the kinetic plus the potential energy for the electron. The kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. We're pretty familiar with that one. And the potential is the Coulomb potential. So it would be minus um, k minus 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, k is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, the Coulomb constant times e squared over r. And then you sum these two together to get the total energy. When you do that, you get minus ke squared over 2r. All right, so when you plug in 
for what the allowed values of R would be by quantizing the angular momentum, right? You set MVR equal to NH bar and then solve for R and plug that back in. Um, then you get that the allowed values of R are N squared times A naught, where A naught is the Bohr radius, um, 5.3 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. And then you plug that into your expression and you get this expression for the energy, minus Ke squared over 2 A naught times 1 over N squared. And that gives you the energies of the energy levels. When you solve for the constants, minus Ke squared over 2 A naught, you get minus 13.6 EV, minus 13.6 electron volts divided by n squared for n being the energy level, okay? So this was all covered in modern one, all right? If you're a little shaky on this, it might be good to go back and review those earlier chapters. Um, I think in the book it's chapter four and read up on the Bohr model of the atom if, if you feel the need for review. Okay, so that led to an energy level diagram that looked like this. Um, basically, electrons would transition from higher energy levels into lower ones, and when they did that, they would emit photons, and then those photons had the wavelengths that were described by uh, uh, the models that had already been put out there by Lyman and Passion and Brackett and all those guys, okay? So the Lyman series was when it made the transition to the ground state, the n equal to one state. The Balmer series, the visible light, was when it was making a transition from a higher level to the n equal to two state, and the Passion was to the n equal to three state, and so on and so forth, okay? And so this very well described the uh, spectra that were coming from hydrogen, was coming from the hydrogen atom. And so this was a huge success for the Bohr model. But even from the very beginning, there were problems with the Bohr model. And everybody knew about these problems. They just couldn't figure out a way to explain them given um, sort of a classical explanation of physics. So what were the difficulties? Well, first of all, once we improved our spectroscopy a little bit and our spectroscopic techniques, we got better resolution um, of the lines from the emission spectra, okay? And we found that if you looked at one spectral line from the hydrogen atom, it really wasn't just one spectral line, that some of the lines, not all of them, but some of the lines were actually triplets, okay, or even quintuplets, and so on and so forth. So with poor resolution, what looked like one line with good resolution was actually three lines, and that was considered confusing and not something that could be explained by the Bohr model of the atom. One fun uh, place to look about this is if you look um, at sunspots, okay, because these these triplets, the splitting, took place in when the atoms were in a strong magnetic field. And of course, there's very strong and very large magnetic fields in the sun, and in these sunspots in particular, the magnetic fields can get very large. So if you look at the emission spectra from the light from the sun near a sunspot, you'll see the line split into a triplet. And that's what this image here depicts. So this is an image here on the left of a sunspot, and then what they did was they took spectrum from the light all along this black line here, they took a spectrum, and that's shown here in green and black on the right hand side. This is courtesy of uh, NOAA, and this was taken in 1974. All right, so there was um, so-called Zeeman. This was known as the Zeeman effect. The splitting of spectral lines was the Zeeman effect. Um, and this triplet, you can see very clearly where one line splits into three lines when it gets near that sunspot, okay? And if you can look at the cross section of where it's passing through the sunspot, you can see that there's those three lines or three blobs there that the line passes through and you can see very clearly the splitting of the spectral lines as it passes through that sunspot, okay? And this picture was taken um, at the uh, Kitt Peak Observatory. So this was one of the things, um, probably the most pressing issue for the Bohr model of the atom and everyone knew that the picture wasn't complete. Well, it took this guy right here to figure out the solution to this problem. This is Erwin Schrodinger. Um, and he was an American physicist, and he's best known as one of the creators or architects of quantum mechanics. And what he did was he developed the Schrodinger equation that we covered in Modern One. Um, here it is right here, minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative with respect to position of the wave function plus 
the potential energy times the wave function is equal to the energy times the wave function. This is the time independent Schrodinger equation and it's the equation used when your potential energy function does not depend upon time. Um, and this is a one-dimensional. We're going to have to use the three-dimensional one to solve the hydrogen atom later, but to remind you, this is what the Schrodinger equation looks like. All right, here m is the mass of the particle that you're trying to model, e is the energy of the particle, and u is the potential energy. Well, just to share with you a little something, I've been reading a biography on Schrodinger, and he was one of the most interesting guys, I think, ever in physics. If you've ever thought that physicists are a boring group of people, then you really need to read Schrodinger's biography. He, um, he got ran out of Austria in the late 1930s because he opposed the Nazi party. Um, he was a big opponent of the Nazis and so he got fired from his professor job um, there in Austria and he had to emigrate to England and later Ireland um, to work. Well on his immigration papers he requested that not only his wife and child be admitted along with him but his girlfriend Hilda March who he had fathered a child with um, some years earlier. So he was in a menage a trois relationship um, and he had a few children by these women. Not only that, but after he moved to Ireland, he fell in love with an actress. Um, I think her name was Sheila May. And then later he fathered a child with her as well. And he fathered another child with a whole mother woman um, a little bit later. So the guy, the guy got around. You know, wow, really impressive um, for a physicist, I think. Um, he had tuberculosis, um, and he died of tuberculosis. And one of his times in the sanitarium was um, when he, uh, he was working on his quantum mechanical equation during the 1920s when he was in a sanitarium for his tuberculosis. So interesting guy. If you get a chance to read an autobiography, I'm sorry, a biography on Schrodinger, you should really give it a read. He was quite fascinating. All right, so basically, one of the things that Schrodinger did, one of the first things that he did, was he solved, using his new equation, the um, hydrogen atom problem. So what he did was, into the equation, he stuck the potential energy function for the hydrogen atom. And yet again, it's the Coulomb potential, so minus Ke squared over R um, is the Coulomb potential, or K is the Coulomb constant, 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meters squared for Coulomb. Um, Coulomb squared. Now the proton um, in this solution, in the solution, you put the proton or the nucleus at the origin and then the position of the electron is described by R. Okay, but you can't use a one-dimensional Schrodinger equation in order to solve the hydrogen atom because it's a 3D problem, right? So basically you have to move into three dimensions. When you do that, you're not just taking the second derivative of the wave function with respect to x, you've got to take it with respect to all the partial, uh, you've got to take partial derivatives, second order partial derivatives with respect to all of the coordinates, x, y, and z. However, since the potential function um, is only given with respect to r, that is kind of awkward. So it's better to use spherical coordinates, okay? And so when you use spherical coordinates and shift this, um, uh, derivative from a Cartesian over to a spherical coordinate system that changes what the partials look like okay so I'm not going to get into details on this I'm just going to kind of present to you with magical waves of my hand what the solution to the hydrogen atom is but here's the equation that must be solved and you can see that it's kind of a doozy once you switch it over from Cartesian to spherical coordinates. The, uh, the uh, switch for how you translate your x, y, and z coordinates given here, um, and you probably covered it in Calc 3. Um, but of course you wouldn't get into solving um, uh, multiple coordinate second order um, differential equations without taking a differential equations class. So I'm not going to mess with that too much. Okay. Um, but basically, you're converting from a function of x, y, and z to a function of r, theta, and phi. Okay, so r would be the distance um, from the origin to the point. 
theta is the angle that swings from the z-axis down to the vector, and phi is the angle that swings in the xy plane out to the projection of the vector. Okay? So using these three coordinates, what you can do is assume that the wave function psi can be separated into three functions that are independently functions of r and theta and then phi, and then you just multiply those things together to get psi. Um, and that's how you solve it. It's called a separable differential equation. Now remember that you're going to have a quantum number, and the quantum number will correspond, you'll have the same number of quantum numbers as you have degrees of freedom. So for three dimensions, you should have three degrees of freedom, and hence three quantum numbers. We talked about this a little bit in Modern 1 when we talked about the three-dimensional infinite square well, and we had quantum numbers n1, n2, and n3 with links l1, l2, and l3 of our little cube. You might remember that. If you don't, just understand that your three, um, three coordinates necessitate three um, quantum numbers to describe the system. Now, what do the solutions to the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom look like? Well, they look like this, okay? Basically, you end up with a radial wave function, which is just a function of r, and you end up with what are called the spherical harmonic functions, which are functions of theta and phi. Um, lots of times they call them the YLMs. They often uh, use a Y to symbolize the spherical harmonics. Okay? And you get different quantum numbers. Your quantum numbers here are N, L, and M sub L. That's what they've chosen to name them, and it's pretty standard across all textbooks. Um, and the values we're going to cover as to what they mean. But this is what the functions look like. They're kind of messy looking, and they turn out some really beautiful solutions, as we'll see in the next lecture. So these three different values of quantum numbers, you'll have integer values for each of those three values, and then they dictate what wave function you pick to describe what the motion of that electron in the hydrogen atom looks like. And we'll cover that more next time, okay? So um, we're gonna finish up now. My references are several modern physics textbooks and others, as I indicated when I stole a figure. I tried to be really careful about citing it. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next lecture.